Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the Refuels Week webinars. My name is Dave Keating. I'm a journalist based in Brussels, and I'm going to be guiding us through today's conversation, coming at you live from the heart of the EU quarter as we talk about the science and technologies behind low-carbon liquid fuels. Now, this is part of Refuels Week, which is a series of webinars that's going into in-depth with some of the main issues facing liquid fuels. We want you at home to be asking challenging questions and to go away feeling that you have learned something. Now, yesterday we had our kickoff event for this series, uh, and we heard about more the political dimensions here. So we talked about the utility of having a liquid fuel strategy at EU level, and John Cooper Cooper from Fuels Europe presented the Clean Fuels for All pathway. Uh, now that pathway envisages up to 150 million tons of liquid fuels by 2050. You can see it there on the slide here. Uh, now that in pathway that's being envisioned there, as John mentioned yesterday, is going to require between 450 and 650 billion euros of investment, which is a lot of money. Now, this is how Fuels Europe is presenting the data collected by Konkawi, the European Refining Industry's scientific and technical body, and that was developed within its Low Carbon Pathways program. So today we're going to hear directly from the horse's mouth. We're going to hear from Konkawi about the science behind this report. And that's really the focus of today. Yesterday was the focus on the politics. Today is a focus on the science. And in particular, we want to analyze the data that form the basis for this pathway. Now, this program from Kankawe aims at exploring the potential, both in quantitative terms and over a reference timeline, of the production of low-carbon liquid fuels until 2050, and also their effective contribution to the decarbonization of transport and the scale and cost of the required industry transformation. Understanding the methodology and the assumptions is therefore obviously essential. And that's what we're going to be getting to today, comprehending the readiness level of the proposed technological routes, their potential to be deployed at scale in the near future, and the opportunity to be integrated in the existing fueling system. These are all important aspects to consider. So for this session, we have two experts from the industry and academia to discuss the science and technologies supporting Fuels Europe's low carbon liquid fuels strategy. And I will introduce them now. First, we have Marta Hugo, science executive with Kankawi. Marta has over 15 years of experience in the oil and gas industry, initially as a refining process engineer at Repsol Technology Center, and then as a senior energy and carbon analyst before joining Kankawi in 2017. Then we have Thomas Koch. Thomas is a professor at Karlsruhe Institute of Technology and the Institute of Internal Combustion Engines. Welcome to both of you. Thanks so much for joining us today. Marta, let's start with you. Uh, I already kind of teed up the Clean Fuels for All pathway, um, but can you explain to us how Kankawi developed the scenarios and the study, studies that Fuels Europe used as the basis for its strategy? Of course, uh, thank you. First of all, let me thank you for uh, for the invitation to to join this webinar. It's a pleasure to be here, actually representing Concawe. And as you uh, very well explained, Concawe is a scientific uh, body, not European Refining Association. And actually, I'm here representing the a whole team of people uh, working together in our low carbon pathways within the Secretariat, but also with. Uh, a team of experts from different member companies, like we we all working together, not to really understand uh, the the challenges that the industry is facing when looking into the future. Uh, so everything started. Uh, listen, I'm gonna give you a little bit of story for everybody to start with um, history to start with. Um, it started in like five years ago when we started the low carbon pathways program, in which we would like to we wanted to understand the technologies that could contribute to reduce uh, the carbon intensity of the refining sites as well as the carbon intensity of uh, the fuels that are being used you know, in the different uh, transport segments. So we asked ourselves. Uh, what are like the 
the, the technologies that could contribute, what kind of uh, new type of engines, new type of fuels could emerge and could be used in the different transport segments from passenger cars to heavy duty uh, to the maritime sector and, and aviation and understanding uh, the transformation actually you know, of the, the refining industry, actually how we can uh, align with the climate ambition you know, that the European Commission was like, putting in front, in front of us. Um, so in the low carbon pathways uh, that you area in Concagua, you will find like a number of different reports where we have been uh, trying to answer different questions that we ask ourselves. And actually, we developed uh, a couple of um, years ago the concept of uh, what we call the Refinery 2050. And I'm trying to show it in a second in the next slide, which is, yeah, here it's coming. Of course, it takes uh, some time because it's flying to 2050. But actually, in the in the different reports that we have um, published in this low carbon public area, we explore this concept. No, so uh, how we can actually reduce the carbon intensity there? And then um, we understood that, that uh, the first step is actually improving our energy efficiency and improving um, the way the energy that we, we consume within the sites. Uh, also, we started like implementing in, in our models uh, technologies such as the clean hydrogen, so replacing the conventional way of producing hydrogen by alternative ways to produce it in a in a way in which less CO2 is emitted. And here we are speaking about the combination of uh, steam methane reformant with CCS or with uh, um, hydrogen from water electrolysis that we will speak a little bit more uh, later on. Uh, we also included, boosted, you know, the incentivized the electrification of the processes, uh, taking advantage of the renewable electricity that will be available. Uh, and also we explore technologies such as process electrification. Uh, we, we also implemented uh, CCS to the capture and storage the remaining CO2 emissions. And all of that we published you know, in an initial report, but we, we we thought and we realized that that was not enough. So implementing technologies, um, CO2 related technologies within our sites, that was not enough to take us to the level of CO2 reductions that we wanted to achieve, not compatible with this 1.5 tech scenario. So we took it to the next level, which actually is, is what we call the evolution, the transformation of the refinery, in which we say, okay, in order to reduce uh, the, the CO2 emissions, we have to look at the whole picture, well to wheels, from the moment in which uh, the feedstocks are produced until the moment that the fuels are used. And in order to do so, and in order to reduce really the CO2 emissions within the whole uh, picture, we need to start replacing oil. And oil has been for many, many years the principal, the main fixed stock um, for our refineries and the diesel and the gasoline not that we have today and the kerosene and the marine fuel that we have today in the market are based on oil. So we said, okay, what do we start replacing this oil by alternative feedstocks? Feedstocks such as uh, residues, waste materials, or even CO2. Uh, what is the level of CO2 emissions that we could achieve? Uh, with that? No, that we could achieve across the whole uh, value chain. And this is indeed what we explored in the Refinery 2050 model. Again, where we started implementing uh, different technologies, alternative fixtures, really pushing the limits and really replacing oil to the minimum, uh, and then assessing no, the, the carbon intensity of, of the products. Um, by when we are replacing the soil by alternative fixtures, what we produce are fuels which are really similar to the gasoline, diesel, and kerosene that we have today. So those fuels, um, most of the cases, are really compatible with the engine. So you can put it directly in your in your vehicles. And we started calling them the low carbon liquid fuels because they are produced in a really low carbon intensive matter within the site, but implementing all those technologies within the refineries and also by replacing oil by alternative fuels. So that was a starting point. But then we ask ourselves, okay, that's the 2050, but how we can move from where we are today up to this 2050? What kind of trajectory uh, we could or we couldn't visit. And we realized that yeah, in order to, to, we don't really know. I mean, the uncertainty from today to towards 2050 
is really high, and we decided to explore different scenarios. We have different demand scenarios, so trying to, to assess, okay, what kind of uh, engines, type of engines will be there, uh, what kind of what is the level of energy efficiency uh, that could be achieved from today to towards 2050 also reducing the demand of those uh, low carbon um, low carbon fuels and then we use as the basis for our demand scenarios um, the clean planet uh, for all the scenarios that uh, was published by the european commission led by tt clima a couple of years ago and are also the basis you know, for the recently published 2030 impact assessment um so we said okay from where we are today 2015 well more just in between no? uh, down to 2050 and 2030 2050 the first thing that we can see is a reduction in the demand for, for total energy carriers, but a reduction of demand for the uh, liquid fuels, you know, as a consequence of, as, as I mentioned, of energy efficiency, as well as the penetration of alternative power trains. I would say, okay, those different scenarios, depending on how uh, we envisage uh, this penetration of the different power trains, the different type of fuels, that the remaining demand for um, low carbon liquid fuel could be different and could vary uh, between, again, the different transport sectors. In heavy duty in passenger cars, we will have a, a certain electrification that will be key. Heavy duty, we will see electrification of hydrogen and gaseous fuels. In maritime, it will change also to uh, some kind of gaseous fuels and alternative fuels. And for maritime, uh, for aviation, probably we see more uh, the liquid fuels. So th that was the first step. Um, and those were the real debates no, for all the scenarios that we have assessed. Um, in the scenario that is um, selected, was selected by uh, by Fuels Europe to portray the clean fuels for all scenario, we are actually uh, is is the maximum demand scenario. So we want to really to explore a, a case in which we still see uh, the role of low carbon fuels there, and we are. We wanted to understand the implications in terms of volumes of low carbon fuels that uh, could be achieved uh, from twenty from today, actually, to 2050, the level of CO2 emissions that could be uh, reduced, uh, and the, the intensity of the investment no, that will be required. So uh, as mentioned, for those scenarios, we started in 2030 with our own uh, modeling. And, and also, we have recently published a report in which we um, we have modeled the evolution of the and the penetration of the different power trains in all the transport sectors and the availability of uh, these low carbon fuels based on a market based approach. And when moving into 2050, we are actually referring to, to the scenarios from the Commission. And for this maximum scenario that we are speaking about today, uh, actually, we use the 1.5 tech scenario for aviation, uh, the hydrogen maritime 70 for maritime, because there was no, for those of you familiar with the 1.5 scenario that was known as such a scenario there. And then for, for road, for passenger cars, and for heavy duty, uh, in this maximum scenario, as I mentioned, we decided to use actually the 2050 baseline. Uh, why? And we can explore and expand a little bit more later in the questions and answer session. Uh, why? Because we wanted, as I mentioned, to explore the, the maximum case. So in this base of the scenario, we still see a significant reduction of the demand of liquid fuels in road transport, and we see a significant penetration of electrification, almost half of the, um, of the fleet being electrified by, by 2050, but we still wanted to explore um, uh, yeah, the, the potential demand not for low carbon fuels there. So uh, once the demand the scenarios have been uh, defined and as mentioned, we can explore a little bit more later. Uh, the question is, okay, if the demand is there, if the demand for, for oil and for liquid fuels, actually for the whole liquid fuel pool, uh, what? A kind of a low carbon liquid fuel actually could start uh, replacing this oil progressively from now down to 2050, which are the key technologies, and which are the key feedstocks actually no, that we could use to produce those low carbon fuels. And actually, the first thing that we I want to highlight is that there's no single solution. So there are multiple technologies, and this is the first thing that we identified and we we keep on repeating and repeating no, in all the reports. We cannot rely on just one source. And actually what we are doing is like, we are moving from a food and crop uh, based uh, biofuels, which are 
actually keeping the cap as defined in the Red Tomb uh, Directive. And we are uh, moving into alternative type of systems, uh, which ones it could be, um, it works, it could be uh, biomass residues from agriculture uh, residues or forestry residues. Uh, it could be waste materials. And here we are speaking about municipal waste. It could be uh, waste cooking oil. It could be the non-recycling part of the recyclable part of, of plastic, all kinds of waste materials that you can imagine. And, and even CO2 could be considered as a as feedstock. You know, we could capture the CO2 and uh, together with renewable electricity, we can produce a synthetic fuel, which is called e-fuels. And, and also those kind of feedstocks are, are multiple, no? but then uh, and achieving, of course, significant uh, CO2 reductions uh, versus the conventional oil-based fuels. But okay, we have the feedstocks, but we cannot put the feedstock. No, we are speaking about these residues and these waste materials that unfortunately cannot be fed directly into our engine. So maybe we need to convert it into something else. And here, if we had a multiple variety of feedstocks uh, available, we have a multiple variety of technologies, conversion technologies that could take us from the feedstock down to the finished uh, product. And here, this is just an illustrative example to show you that uh, the picture is, is not easy, it's complex. And, and again, there's no just one single route, but multiple routes. So depending on where the refinery will be located, depending on the, uh, the surroundings of the, the how close different feedstocks are from the conversion sites. One refinery could, could uh, pick and choose one pathway, other could uh, have more forestry residues available because they have um, like a well-managed forest uh, close by. So what we wanted to see is like the, the, the technologies are there, some of the technologies are there, some others are being developed. Uh, but the, the, the scope is, is wide, no? and there's no just one single solution. So from out of this map of fixed stocks, different fixed stocks, different conversion technologies, for our scenarios, we said, OK, let's try to pick something just in order to do this uh, manageable. Uh, let's try to select some representative examples. And the criteria to select those examples were, OK, let's pick the technologies that are higher uh, technology readiness levels, so already at commercial scale or in the process of being scaled up and in a short period of time, because we will speak a lot of, um, about that later, the 2020-2030 period is critical. So the ones that where we see the potential not to really um, being developed and deployed at commercial scale during this time frame, let's focus on them. And let's focus also as a criteria uh, on uh, the ones which could produce a fuel that is compatible you know, with the with the engines, with the cars, with the uh, airplanes that we have today, almost no, with uh, some minor adjustment in, in some cases. So that was the criteria to select the technologies, and and therefore uh, what we uh, selected and what we you can see in the uh, clean fuels for all strategy in this maximum scenario that I mentioned are basically the uh, hydro treating vegetable oils. Uh, we are using uh, some oil-based um, feedstocks and convert it into um, gasoline, jet, and, and diesel. Again, paraffinic ones and uh, with similar properties um, and compatible with the engines uh, we have today. Uh, and this is existing and already at commercial scale. And we have a number of uh, plants and sites uh, already uh, producing this, this HBO already in the market. Then uh, we consider also what we call biomass to liquids. So this conversion of more lignocellulosic materials, those materials from the forest, from the residues, from the forest and the agricultural residues, and uh, we convert it into liquid. As mentioned, many technologies uh, can be implemented here just for the sake of simplicity. We chose the gasification and fissure trap that we believe that um, is one of the technologies that could be uh, developed in this within this time frame and actually here what we do is we basically gasify these residues and then uh, you pre-treat the gases that you produce and 
with a different process, in this case is a physiotrope uh, process, you produce a synthetic fuel, which is, as I mentioned, uh, very similar in terms of the characteristics to the fuels that we have today. So that's the biomass to liquid, and then um, scarification, or some pyrolysis could be there, and we actually, we treat it within the capex, as I, mean, I would mention in a second. And then we have another big family, which is the e-fuels, and I've already mentioned it very briefly. So those are like, Kind of novel uh, fuels you now in which the starting point, the fix that is actually CO2 that you capture. Uh, you also produce uh, what we call, commonly called green hydrogen. You will hear a lot about this, which is actually hydrogen produced through water, electrolysis of water using renewable electricity here. And then uh, you can combine it, those CO2 and that hydrogen through different processes to produce, as I mentioned, um, a synthetic fuels, which is called in this case e fuel. So those are like the three big groups um, of uh, new technologies that we have included in our uh, in, in our scenarios. Uh, but that was not all. As I mentioned, it's not only about like replacing. Um, replacing the, the, the oil is also about implementing um, CO2 reduction technologies within the sites uh, to reduce the carbon intensity also no, in the in the production sites. And here we are speaking about maximizing the use of this clean hydrogen as a way to reduce the carbon also footprint of the the fossil based products no, during the transition from today down to 2050, and also as a way to increase the yields, actually, uh, the conversion no, of, the, of the biomass into the final fuels. And also, um, we implement the concept of the CO2 capture and storage, the, the so called CCS. And here, the concept is capturing the CO2 that is emitted at the site and just storing in uh, underground you know, to. Um, permanently storage it to, to avoid you know, the emissions of that CO2 during the conversion phase. And we see CCS, uh, look at CCS from a different angle, from a double angle. The first one is at the beginning when you still have a, a significant amount of oil being processed you know, in this 2030 period. Uh, we see it as a way to reduce the, the emissions there. But then as you move and you progressively replace oil by alternative um, feedstocks by biomass, uh, in specifically speaking about, for example, the gasification one, you can couple this biofuel production with this CCS. So actually the CO2 that is emitted is coming from the biomass, but instead of emitting it to the, um, uh, to the atmosphere, could be neutral to capture it and you storage it. And actually there's a way to produce uh, negative emissions that are crucial and are recognized as crucial also by the European Commission not to, uh, to take us to the, um, to the goals that are defined in the climate, uh, climate ambition. Um, so the 1.5 basically degrees. Um, so those are like a, a very brief and quick overview of the kind of technologies, the thinking, and also the, the, the logic you know, that we have followed uh, to explore these scenarios that I've just mentioned. Yeah, the next step, of course, was like uh, once those technologies are implemented, we have defined when a progressive um, deployment of those technologies, accelerating actually very much the, the, the scale up and the mass deployment of technologies that are not at commercial scale today. Uh, and this will require a significant amount of investment. That, uh, and also yesterday during the, the previous webinar, they mentioned that the, the level of investment that are required are far above 150 million euros, uh, close to 700 uh, for the, the period. Uh, in the maximum scenario, what we um, foreseen is the production of around these 150 million tons of oil equivalent of low carbon liquid fuels and, and, and compatible in all in all no, with the, the ambition to reach this 1.5 um, degrees across the whole European economy. So Dave, I hope that I've uh, given a, a bit overview uh, to set the scene and I'm, I'm more than happy to elaborate a little bit more later.
Thanks a lot, Marta. We've already had some questions for you come in, so I'll be asking those to you a little later. Just a reminder, uh, you guys at home can ask your questions to the panelists using that chat box next to your video. But next, let's hear from Thomas. Now, Thomas, you have been working on this refuels project with the regional government of Baden-Württemberg. Can you tell us a little bit about that project and also whether it could be a blueprint for an EU strategy? I think you're on mute, Thomas. Yes, yes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you very much for the invitation and thank you for the um, question. Indeed, it's a pleasure um, for myself to report today about some insights, about some ideas and some necessities which we elaborated coming out of our very important refuse project. Um, before starting, it's very interesting to see that also we did not exchange us with Marta Hugo. Um, we see that there are many ideas in parallel. We coming more or less from the vehicle research side and not so much from the refinery side. Um, also the refinery um, is also part of the refuels project. So um, let's see how many <clears throat> similar ideas we have elaborated. Um, are low carbon refuels a solution? So that's the main question and um, an assessment from our side. So let's start. And I think I can also, it's very important, um, quickly jump over this page, but not too quickly. There is a clear message that indeed it's the mankind who um, increases the CO2 um, emissions in the air. Now we are close to 400 um, ppm and we are directly heading towards 500 ppm. And it's clear the task of our generation to stop this linear, nearly linear increase of CO2 emissions over the last decades, which is mainly also caused, um, of course, by combustion issues, no doubt about this. And um, uh, there is a clear recommendation of the Intergovernment Panel of Climate Change, IPCC, um, that going back to the year 2018, that there is a final remaining CO2 budget of 420 gigatons. And um, this must be fulfilled, this limit must be fulfilled, not to emit more than 420 gigatons in order to limit the global warming. So this is a recommendation from the IPCC. In other words, there is a limit and we should not exceed this limit. We still have an increase of CO2 emissions, so we have to act. This is the main message coming out of this report, and I agree absolutely. So we have started um, in Baden-Württemberg with uh, many industrial partners and also with important partners from the um, side of the politicians. The Ministry of Transport um, has been um, the leading ministry in Baden-Württemberg who is, um, is very successfully leading this project. Um, and we have many partners from academia, from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. We started this project at the beginning of 2019 and the first um, phase is now ending. And uh, we have many industry partners who have been involved. And the idea has been bringing together academic research and also um, experts from the mineral industry as well as experts from the automobile industry and as well as um, society and politicians all together because the challenge of refuels is a big challenge and it cannot be um, seen only from a particular perspective. The overall perspective is important to um, accomplish this project in a successful way. So um, one important motivation, there are several ones, but one important a motivation for the refuel projects um, is, of course, the current fleet of passenger cars. Of course, we do need refuels also for aviation and also for heavy duty transport. This is clear. But having an eye on the passenger cars, um, you can see here on the slide um, an assumption, assuming we would have a proportion of battery electric vehicle share of sales for a duration of 10 years. So starting at the year 2020, for 10 years until 2030, and assuming a, a share of battery electric vehicles of sales of, let's say, 50% um, even. So every second new car sold in Germany would be, and these are numbers of Germany, but similar um, numbers would be <clears throat> um, the case for other European countries. So assuming we would have every second car a battery electric vehicle. We still would have in the year 2030, after 10 years, 
um, more than 35 million vehicles with internal combustion engine. Indeed, we do not have 50% um, battery electric vehicle share of sales, but assuming a very high share, we still would end up with many millions of internal combustion engine vehicles. So there is a need to have a solution also for these vehicles, for those customers as well. Um, an additional information also plug-in hybrid electric vehicles as well as hybrid electric vehicles, of course, also have an internal combustion engine and also need uh, fuel with a low CO2 impact. Um, and to make this clear as well, the battery electric vehicles are also an important part of the solution, but they're definitely not the only solutions to make this clear. An interesting, very, very attractive and um, also impressive technology, the battery electric vehicles, but they will not fulfill all um, technology um, solutions of the future, not all applications for the customer. So it is completely independent from today's political decisions and from the market response. So no matter what uh, politicians decide today, the most of the total fleet vehicles will have an internal combustion engine in the year 2030. And I'm convinced that also in the year 2040, most of the vehicles will have an internal combustion engine. So we need a solution for these vehicles as well. And um, our solution, which we have elaborated, which in the refuse project is shown here, a first recommendation for the year 2030. And what you can see here is quite in line what Marga Yugo has presented before. And we have a we have presented here and elaborated um, the um, approach for the year 2030 for diesel engines on the left hand side and for gasoline engines or gasoline vehicles on the right hand side. Our recommendation is, um, and this is of major importance, as we do not have enough <clears throat> refuels quantity in the year 2030 to fulfill the complete market desires. We only can work with an increased share of drop-in rate. Um, and the recommendation for the year 2030 is to have an R33 fuel for diesel, which basically has, um, as today, 7% fatty acid um, ether-based fuels, as today, and 26% of um, ray fuel, which can be either hydrogen-treated vegetable oil, or via the biomass um, um, way, as Marga Hugo has presented, or it can be also via the fischer tropsch pass. All passes are possible, but the suggestion is to have a further increase of 26% drop-in rate. And the advantage of this fuel is that it completely fulfills today's specification, and this is very important. If you have a 10-year-old, 15-year-old, 20-year-old vehicle, you must be sure that the fuel you fill in at the filling station fulfills all specifications your car, your vehicle requires. And this is the case with this R33 fuel. And in total, it enables a CO2 reduction potential in the range of 25%. Also for gasoline, our recommendation is to keep the 10% ethanol share and extended by another 30% methanol to gasoline, also synthetic methanol, CO2 neutral methanol, which can be added. And also this fuel, and this is also of major importance, fulfills the gasoline specifications, the so-called EN 228. So every person could fill um, his car with this fuel without having any um, worries about the reliability of the car as complete specifications are fulfilled. Very important um, that um, a fuel CO2 reduction potential of roughly 25% and more can be realized within today's fleet compatible fuel specification. Methanol to gasoline or paraffinic diesel refuel can be produced via different routes as already shown before, either via the biofuel route or the synthetic e-fuel route. And this was only the first step until the year 2030, 2035. 2035. But, and this is in line what uh, Mada Yuko 
has also presented, we need to further reduce the fossil fuel content until roughly 2045, 2050. This can be seen here in this diagram. And of course, the idea is to even accelerate the process. However, as already mentioned before as well, we need to build up the, um, the capabilities. We need to um, adapt the refineries. And of course, we have to build up um, the e-fuel pass um, worldwide. So there is a huge challenge behind. But um, most important message to have a view after the year 2035, we recommend roughly a 50% um, a drop in refuel um, rate in the year 2035. And the compatibility with existing fleet is quite realistic. This must be analyzed in detail. As I've shown before, um, roughly 25% CO2 um, reduction potential is completely possible within today's um, fuel specification. And we are very ambitious that also 50% can be um, <clears throat> can be produced within today's specifications. This means that also a vehicle of the year 2000 could be filled with this fuel of the year 2035 with even 50% CO2 reduction potential. So information on the right-hand side, compatibility of gasoline refuel seems to be a little bit more challenging than the diesel to enable the fleet compatibility, but these are technical issues on a very um, detailed level. I'm convinced that we can accomplish this. Um, a complete compatibility within a range of 50% CO2 reduction potential by increased refuel spending is realistic. And the midterm 90% and higher CO2 reduction um, potential by refuels within the next 25 years um, is our recommendation. And even today's technology, and this is important, can be compatible with 100% refuel content. Um, but a midterm 100% compatibility to all vehicles. This is a challenge which we also must accomplish. We will make this. So a step-by-step -step increase of the drop-in rate is recommended as depicted here in this diagram. And um, uh, an important message from my side is whatever we make here in Europe, we have to have in mind that we are not alone on this planet. And China is definitely following the refuels pass. They are also following other passes. They also um, push battery electric vehicles, which is fine, but they are intensively pushing also the refuels <clears throat> technology. They're pushing the internal engine combustion technology in um, comparison to the European Union. And they have a clear 2035 program to further increase the efficiency also of internal combustion engines which will have to be, of course, electrified in the future, what we call hybridization, but there will be an internal combustion engine also um, in China, <clears throat> in the market also in the next 20 years and even longer. So China is also following the refuels path and we have to decide whether we would also be in line with China politicians or would we have our own policy of the future. Our belief in Carlso is that there is not a single technology option of the future. We believe that there are a couple of technology um, solutions. Depending on the application, there will be an increased share of battery electric vehicles for many, especially urban applications, which is fine. We believe that we will have um, fuel cell vehicles and internal combustion engine vehicles with hydrogen as a very special kind of refuel, but this is not the focus so much today. This is a very special issue. We might have also some methane driven um, applications, but we basically believe that the liquid fuels, the refuels will be of major importance also for passenger car transport and as well as um, also for heavy duty um, transport in the future. So this um, was my quick insight into the refuels project and I'm open to questions and I thank you very much for your attention. Thanks very much, Thomas. I think that last slide about China is in particular quite interesting because 
you know, I think there's a lot of focus on electrification in China, but that graph kind of tells a, a different story there about the direction that China's going in. I wanted to follow up on something you mentioned in your presentation. You said that a potential of 25% fuel CO2 reduction can be achieved in the existing fleet with compatible low carbon fuel specification. But I wonder if that's really enough to meet the 2050 climate neutrality objective. Could you get higher reductions with an accelerated fleet turnover, actually? Basically, it is a question of availability of the refuels. So it's a question of, in, of some research, of course, of invest into um, electrolysis worldwide. So it's basically a question of how quickly can we ramp up this technology? And this is not a ramp up which can occur overnight. So we need time. We need, um, from my point of view, a clear political strategy to support this um, path as well in order to um, enable to build up all the refineries, the complete production passes um, worldwide. Because we will need a worldwide network of um, producing these refuels in Africa, in Arabia, in South America, maybe in other parts of the world, maybe even in North of Europe, it depends. Um, but it is a question, how quickly can these capabilities be built up? Marta, I was wondering during your presentation, of course, we know with any pathway that there are always uncertainties and there are always key variables. There are some things that are a little more certain and some things that are less certain. What would you say are the big uncertainties and challenges for this scenario to be effectively realized by 2050? Hi, you're on mute. Yeah, I've just realized. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so actually challenges. Oof. <laughs> so actually we could see, I mean, we look at the the shape of the curve, no, from where we are today and we would want to be by 2050, we see that the, the whole curve and all, all the scenarios, I mean, have a number of really important challenges. Some of them are more technology related ones. Uh, so as I mentioned, some of the technologies are not uh, available at commercial scale yet. So scalability is an issue. Um, we have some pilots, uh, plants, um, semi-commercial scale ones, uh, but again, how to ramp up these, how to accelerate this uh, development and deploying those technologies in the 2020 to 2030 timeframe would be uh, crucial in how to make it economically viable as well. So improving the technology, the efficiencies, uh, to create like a business case also not for the, for the investors. So that's one theme. Um, the other one uh, is like the availability, for example, of, of resources. So here we are speaking about actually a transition also in the type of feedstock from the oil or from the more fruit and crop based biofuels that we have today. There was a different set of uh, biofuels you know, that will be there mostly based on residues and waste materials, and CO2. So the creation of the supply chain is not there. So we need to mobilize those resources uh, to make it happen in a sustainable way, uh, managing the way that we, um, uh, we take those residues no, from the agriculture fields or from the forest. Uh, and we have to do it at scale. And, and this is not minor. So the challenges are, in, are like going, as you can see, far beyond the battery limits of the refining business. So that's why I always say that this is a, a joint challenge, that we cannot go alone and we don't want to, to go alone uh, in this path. And we need to, um, to join forces and create actually the whole uh, value chain you know, of this 2050 picture that we have here. Um, so that's another level of challenges. <laughs> the third level of challenge could be like the engineering, you know, the skills that are required, the engineering forces that are required uh, to, to actually to deploy these technologies very quickly in a short period of time are massive. Uh, so this could be also a potential uh, bottleneck and that we consider it not being minor and, and has to be also considered. And 
and all of that yeah, uh, to happen, as I mentioned, in a short period of time, because if we want to reach, actually, we want to reach uh, at the 1.5 degrees scenario by 2050, uh, we need to accelerate the deployment of these technologies. So Thomas mentioned the percentage in 2030, but from there to 2050, a massive scale up need to happen. In, and this, this decade is crucial um, to, to really make it happen. And another challenge uh, from the, actually from the deployment point of view is that uh, in our scenarios, what we are saying is, okay, first of a kind uh, plants are built in this decade, close to 20, before if possible 2025 or around 2025 for those e-fuels for those biomass to liquid technologies at the industrial scale and then uh, we just give those a couple of years for those first of a kind plants to actually to prove that they can produce those fuels uh, they can operate in a continuous mode and then we just go accelerate the deployment of the next ones without waiting and without further delay. And it's also something at the risk that is associated to the to actually to invest in you know, in, in these technologies without having a X number of years of uh, continuous operation proving that technology is valid. The risk associated to that is, is huge and is not minor. So that's also part of the challenges. But I mentioned for me the most important one is just the the making together or linking all the partners together so that we, we work, work together towards the same goal. This is probably the big advantage and the big challenge at the same time. You mentioned acceleration. I had a, a similar question for you as I had asked Thomas, which is the, the pace here, the speed. I mean, I noticed that the scenario seems to show a fairly slow ramp up. And I wonder what is the reason for the, that ramp up being so slow and is there any way to accelerate it? Question to my side? Uh, it was for Marta, actually. Right. Yeah, we want to, but Thomas, please uh, feel, feel free to, uh, to say also your, your view here. Uh, so for me, the problem is exactly the challenges that I mentioned, no? that is um, some of the technologies we need to start with the first of a kind of those plants at the industrial size. Uh, so really a size which is uh, big enough. And, and we this needs to happen uh, close to, <laughs> not tomorrow, but the day after, so before 2025, so that we can have the volumes that Thomas was referring to uh, for the blending in, in 2030. Um, and then we need to create, as mentioned, the supply chains and, and make sure that uh, everything is sustainable. So accelerate and the risk associated to this, uh, the, the deployment of the, the second plants uh, once the first of a kind are built, um, all of that requires uh, time and, and it's, it's really a challenge. Um, there are also some, some potential ways to accelerate this um, by using, for example, I don't know, most of the technologies that are already at commercial scale. And here we are speaking about hydrotreated uh, vegetable oil, the HVO that we were referring to. Um, allowing uh, maybe some additional volumes for the waste-based fuels uh, to get there. But all of those kind of considerations are, I would say, are more political ones and technical ones, so I would prefer not to get there. Um, but I mentioned just the technical challenges, the supply chain challenges, the risks associated to building the plants, the uh, uh, the resources, engineering resources that are required make really, really, really a challenge uh, to, to accelerate you know, what we are seeing here. As mentioned, so in this uh, maximum scenario that Fuel Europe is, is using, most of those uh, fuels are advanced uh, biofuels and we need to, um, we need to, to build the, the whole chain you know, to, to make this happen. And even if it's, it looks, it may look uh, just, um, with a little ambition actually is super challenging for, for the industry. And, and from there, that will settle the pace and then we can ramp up in the, in the next decade. Thomas, do you agree with Marta's assessment about where the biggest technical challenges lie? I absolutely agree. I absolutely agree. And um, to make this clear from my point again, if you would if you will accomplish successfully the CO2 reduction goals, either 50% or 55 or 60% in the next 10 years, we need all technologies and we definitely do need 
a quick ramp up also of the refuse technology. Maybe we all should have started a couple of years earlier, but that's not the question now. The question now is how can we also enable that the fuel also contributes to CO2 reduction contribution of the future. And there we need, and this is an important message from my point of view, we need the synthetic fuels, the fuels, but we also need an increased biofuel um, strategy, which is so not so much in the heads of many politicians. We do also need some feedstock based strategy for the future. I do not see a realistic chance to fulfill 50% and more CO2 reduction in another way. So this is my clear recommendation. This is a very ambitious goal and I appreciate very ambitious goals, but in order to accomplish it, we will need, especially in the next decade, we will need a quick ramp up also of biofuel based fuels. Okay, let's take some questions from the audience. Marta, the first question is for you. This question comes from Michael Bipis, uh, or Bip. Uh, so you mentioned energy efficiency. What is your position on reduction cost per carbon unit? Wouldn't that be more guiding with regards to conventional combustion engines? Thank you, for, uh, Michael, for the question. Um, I'm not sure if I understand the question very well, so I'm trying to give you the answer of what I'm, I'm taking. Um, so in terms of the, the energy efficiency measures, actually our takeaway is, I mean, first of all, let me, let me start in another way. Um, when we have explored all these technologies to reduce CO2 efficiency, uh, we have also looked into the cost issues, you know, the level of investment that will be required. And we have estimated what we call the CO2 abatement cost. So, it, the, so we express in terms of um, this reduction and this investment in terms of a ratio. So the euros that you need to spend to reduce one ton of CO2. And this is a very powerful tool to allow us to compare different technologies. So by implementing energy efficiency, it's not only that you reduce CO2, you also reduce the fuel that you have to burn, that you have to spend in the process, the, the fuel of the electricity, the energy that you require, and therefore it gives you some benefit. It's not to invest, but you also get some revenues because you have to spend less in, this, um, in the energy that you put into the process. And therefore, for the energy efficiency measures, um, depending on the, the prices and then depending on the level of um, uh, the prices and the scenarios that you consider, you can achieve even um, negative uh, CO2 abatement costs. So energy efficiency in industry and refineries, in, in the power trains, is always the best uh, measure and the first one that has to be implemented. Energy efficiency first goes first. So that's, that's, the, that's the first comment. And when we compare like energy efficiency versus other alternative fuels, other alternative technologies, other alternative powertrains, they always have a higher CO2 abatement cost. You need to invest more to reduce the CO2. So you have what we call uh, the curve, the CO2 abatement curve, where little by little you will be, or, or aggressively, actually you will be, uh, you will start implementing different technologies. But in most of the cases, energy efficiency and those things will be cheaper than implementing any other kind of alternative technology within the site or within the power plants. Okay, another question for you, Marta. This comes from Olivier Mace. Uh, what would it take uh, what would it take for a conventional refinery to run entirely on non-fossil feedstocks? Which units would become obsolete? As an example, CDU or VDU. That's a, a very good question. Um, so as mentioned, it will it will depend on the. There's no single answer for this. It will depend on the uh, configuration of the site, on the availability of feedstocks that the site has close by, and depending on the configuration and the type of new technologies and alternative feedstocks that will be integrated within the um, the refinery, different units will be more or less utilized. So I'm afraid that here I cannot give you uh, one single answer. Of course. Uh, the, the, the top in unit, which is actually the first unit of the refinery processing the oil, will be 
definitely less utilized because uh, there will be no, no crude. Um, so for example, we will we see that we will require more hydrogen. And so therefore the, the hydrogen production units uh, moving into these clean hydrogen technologies will increase the activity. We would need more hydro, treated, hydro treatment, hydro cracking from the conversion um, from the conventional process units within the refineries, uh, but also FCC, you can find different routes in which FCC could be uh, utilized. So again, not a single answer, and I will like to refer you to the Refinery 2050 report in which we have explored different technologies and how the integration of those different technologies could uh, impact on the utilization of the, um, the, the conventional units in the refinery. But I want to also to mention that uh, the refinery of the future will be actually a, a wider system. So it will not only be the existing units, so it will be the combination of the existing units plus and the new conversion facilities will need to be built. Some of them will be built uh, within the industrial sites. Some of them will be uh, co-located, but definitely totally integrated within the, the existing site. But of course, there will be like a, an evolution that we, um, we are sure that we can make use of the existing assets and some of the, the units um, will be uh, utilized and run in, with a higher capacity. Okay, the next question is for Thomas. Uh, this question comes from Alan Gelder. Has there been any analysis of the costs of production for refuels? Indeed, there have been plenty and I have some even confidential information. So what I can already confirm is that depending on a couple of boundary conditions which all influence, of course, the final cost, the order of magnitude of roughly one euro per liter production is very, very realistic. The order of magnitude might be slightly less, might be slightly more, but it's not two euro, it's not three euro. Um, finally, and it very much depends on the location. And um, this maybe gives me um, the possibility um, to quickly also respond to um, the question which was asked to Marta Yugo before about the energy efficiency. And I would appreciate if I could also comment this um, because it's very often mentioned that um, from the perspective of energy efficiency, the refuels is a wrong pass. The mankind basically does not so much have an energy problem. The sun will shine for the next couple of billion years we have a problem of utilizing the energy. And this means that we somehow have to store it. So this is the problem of the mankind, not to have energy, but to store it. And there are different possibilities. And the possibility, if you talk about energy efficiency, is either we store it typically in the batteries, which is important, which will be built up this technology, or we store it somehow with the help of molecules. So these general possibilities are given electron or molecule storage. So from the perspective of a vehicle, if we have electric energy coming out of photovoltaic or wind craft and store it into um, a battery electric vehicle, we can roughly operate this vehicle two to three times wider, two to three times wider in comparison to making a molecule out of this regenerative electric energy and then operating a modern hybrid vehicle. Very often it is said that there's a factor of seven, sometimes 10, sometimes six, sometimes 12 even. It's factor two to three. So battery electric vehicle is more indeed efficient from the perspective of having in Europe electric regenerative energy and utilizing it. If we calculate this factor two to three, we have, of course, to take into consideration charging losses, winter operation, um, vehicle conditioning losses. We have to compare an electric vehicle with a modern hybrid vehicle, factor two to three. On the other hand side, we have better harvesting factors if we utilize electric energies in those regions of the world, 
Africa, Arabia, South America, regions where we have water, um, cheap um, water um, power, for instance, all over the world. So we have a two to three times higher harvesting factor. So in total, it's averaged. So in the long-term perspective, we will accomplish to be independent from fossil fuel. And our challenge is to remain the today's fossil fuel in the air, in the earth, not having it um, emitted as CO2 in the atmosphere. And this requires that we have to utilize all the sun, the wind and the water power from all over the world stored into molecules and utilize this kind of energy. Okay, we have another question for Marta. This question comes from Marnix Koopman. Uh, Dear Marta, I see that HVO is also converted to gasoline in your sheet. I know only of conversion routes to substi substitutes of diesel and kerosene, HEFA. Can you elaborate on the gasoline routes? Mm. Well, actually, that's a pretty good question. Uh, so HBO is mainly paraffinic, uh, so therefore, like the main route is is always uh, the diesel and, and and jet because they are like perfect the kerosene and diesel because they are like the perfect uh, match for this kind of uh, products. Actually, with an adjustment for the cold properties, uh, of course, for the for the um, for the gasoline, it depends on the route that you use. So you could potentially uh, we have been mentioning that we. A hydro treat the HBO, you hydro crack uh, the HBO, you produce some light components as well uh, that could be um, also far treated and eventually ending in the, uh, in the different pools. So that's, that's uh, what the slide was trying to reflect. But of course, uh, as uh, you are rightly saying, the main bulk of the product is diesel and, and kerosene, and those are like the, the main products the HBO processes are oriented. So Thomas, you, you want to say something here? Okay. <laughs> but thank you for the answer. I think it's a it's a good point for clarification. Yeah. So again, it's it's related to the hydro cracking. Uh, it's not the main product. Great. Good. So next question comes from Dominique Bigot. I think it's for Thomas based on when it came in, but let me know if you think it's actually for Marta. So uh, the question is, what about the, the feedstock availability for LCLF? Maybe this question fits better to Marga. OK, go ahead, Marta. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Actually, uh, thank you for the question. This is the question of the million euros. And of course, it's yeah. the same question that we had in mind when we started all of this. Huh? Uh, what about the feedstock availability? And, and here we, because we don't know the answer, uh, we didn't know, uh, know the answer. We started a, a project in, in Konkawe to actually to explore uh, these feedstock availability issues and trying to answer how much of these feedstocks could become uh, available when and in a sustainable uh, way without impacting uh, biodiversity. So those are like the key key questions that we, we ask ourselves. We commissioned a study uh, with Imperial College and we are about to publish the, the results. Uh, we uh, briefly introduced the, or presented the, the initial results in the last um, Biomass uh, European Conference. But for that, I will invite you to wait one week more because you will have another webinar next week uh, on Wednesday where you will uh, have the whole discussion about this, um, this availability issue. So allow me not to answer this directly and just open the appetite for, for people to wait until next week <laughs> to have a detailed answer from the authors actually of the Indeed, we will tackle that subject next week. Um, Thomas, question for you. Uh, so this question is from Bertrand Gieselink. Rapid electrification of cars means rapid increase of batteries production, which has a high CO2 footprint. Would that help finally make more than refuels? To make this clear, we will have several solutions for the future. And also battery electric vehicles might make sense for a couple of applications. But in general, the battery electric vehicles 
are not for the next 10 to 15 years a technology in overall and I assume now German electricity mix, it might be a little bit different for France with a high nuclear content. I absolutely agree, there's a special case in France, having the German and most of the middle European countries in mind. You do not save CO2 with the help of battery electric vehicles, also not in the next 10 to 15 years. And this is a clear position of the academic society. So. Basically, because of the question, where does the electric energy comes from? And it basically comes still, the incremental energy comes from fossil fuel, also in 10 and 15 years. But this is not an argument against battery electric vehicles. We do need them, but we must be careful and definitely having them, as in the past, produced in China by fossil fuel or by fossil coal, utilizing this energy electric energy to produce batteries, export these cars from China to Europe definitely does not save any CO2 from the overall perspective. But I once again repeat, there's not an argument against battery electric vehicles. We do need them and we do need a low CO2 impact battery technology because of several reasons. Also because we do need hybrid electric vehicles, which also need batteries with a very low CO2 impact. Okay, this next question I believe is for Marta. It's from an anonymous questioner. How were the R33 and G40 fuels calculated? Where are those numbers coming from? I think it's more from is it for Thomas, Thomas, right? Okay, so Thomas, yes. that's a question for you. Yes, yes. <clears throat> yes. Um, we started in the project and as mentioned before we wanted to accomplish a fuel plant which is compatible to the current fuel specification in other words which is compatible to the complete fleet so each and every customer each and every citizen of the european union can fill up his vehicle with this fuel so the basic um goal was to meet today's fuel specifications and they're very complex because many many things have to be um, considered from the outstanding perspective it might not be so trick tricky but it is indeed very tricky because you have to consider density of the fuel temperature behavior of the fuel certain aromatic components I do not want to go into detail but it's very tricky to really meet the fuel specification in detail because many, many um, characteristics must be fulfilled. So that was the first goal to fulfill these important specifications and um, to clearly fulfill them with today's possibilities of fuel, of um, refuel technology, which is um, either a fischer tropsch or a hydrogen treated vegetable oil on the diesel side or methanol to gasoline on the gasoline side. And to increase this content either on the diesel or on the methanol side, MTG side, to a limit that was the first and the dominating goal in the first step. And we want to further increase this goal up to 50% in the second step. But that was the main, motiv the main motivation why we started with R33 and G40 fuel for diesel and gasoline. Hopefully this answers the question. Great, so uh, I have another question. I'm not sure who it's for, so whichever you feel is more capable to answer this, let me know. It's from uh, Joao Rice. How many of the current existing refineries can be converted to future refineries, and how many will have to be built from scratch to supply European needs for LCLF? Marta, do you want to take that one? Okay, maybe, yeah, I can. Um... Let me start that um, as a, an association, we are not getting into the specific business plans uh, for member companies. So this is a decision of the, the member company to decide which strategy uh, they will follow and which kind of technologies they will implement in the sites. Uh, as mentioned, this is not a, just a single answer. Uh, it will depend on the configuration of the site, the accessibility of 
different fee stocks as well as the, the business plan you know, for the individual uh, member companies. So uh, I cannot uh, get there, uh, but I wanted to highlight that again, multiple uh, ways and multiple technologies uh, can be uh, implemented. So the, the, that's, that's the first part of the answer. The second part of the answer, I guess that um, here we have different models. Uh, we have what we call the centralized versus the uh, centralized versus the centralized models. Uh, so here, some of the the technologies will need to be some of the feedstocks will need to be pre-processed, pre-treated. Um, and the way we foreseen this concept of the Vision 2050 is that you pre-treat it somewhere else uh, to produce something which is. Uh, not finalized, not really to meet the specification that Thomas was referring to. And then uh, you use the refinery as this kind of energy hub you know, as the way in which you integrate some of the technologies and you process some of the intermediate products that are also coming from these decentralized plants that will be built also as part of the refining system, not to ensure that the quality and the specifications of the final fuels are compatible with the requirements from the engine side. So again, we, the way we see this is a complex uh, and not a single solution. Decentralized plants, uh, centralized uh, refineries, integrating different technologies, different uh, type of feedstocks, not just one. Uh, and again, the, the question on which uh, pathway uh, chosen it will depend on the on the on the companies. Which is clear is the demand will be also reduced uh, for the for these uh, low carbon liquid fuels uh, as energy efficiency penetrates and alternative power trains penetrate uh, penetrate also in the different transport sector. So this will definitely also have an impact on no? the refining business that needs to be assessed and considered when uh, defining the, the picture of the future. Thomas, Thank did you, you want to answer that as well? Oh, I think it's fine. Okay. Marta has done it. Cool. So, uh, so here I have a question for you, Thomas, then. So uh, this is from an anonymous questioner. It is claimed by car manufacturers that Euro 7 requirements will be the death of the internal combustion engine. So who will use e-fuels? Um, OK, thank you for this question. Basically, two complete different questions are mentioned here. The Euro 7 legislation basically um, only refers to the, let's say, undesired emissions which you can avoid. If you have a certain amount of hydrocarbons, you cannot avoid CO2 as emission because it comes out of the hydrocarbons. So this is limited by the CO2 and the Green Deal legislation. Euro 7 limits the other emissions, which are now on a very, very, very low level already. Indeed, the first um, suggestion from the autumn of last year was definitely, definitely not possible to fulfill even with latest technology. And um, I must explain this because a lot of confusion has come up. It is not a question that we want and we will have vehicles who will emit on a very, very ultra low emission level in the future. However, the first kilometer basically is a challenge on a very, very low level, but it still is a challenge until we have heated up the complete catalyst converter of the vehicles. So the first kilometer, we have slightly increased values of emissions which are on a level on an, of a an very good 2015 car. Finally, the emission, the concentration of emission in the cities can be neglected in the future coming from cars. But for the first kilometer, we have a slight contribution and there was an intensive discussion ongoing how this first kilometer must be basically regulated. And I very much appreciate the um, current situation. However, some other issues came up. But to make this clear, the internal combustion engine, which will typically be in hybrid, must solve these challenges, which are 
further tightened, which I appreciate in general, without modifying or improving the fuel composition. It might even help to further improve the emission situation with a new fuel. Reducing the aromatic content might be such an impact. But in general, even with today's fossil fuel, with some disadvantages, um, characteristics, the internal combustion engines will have to fulfill Euro 7. Okay, great. So we have one last question for Marta. This is from an anonymous questioner. Uh, for CO2 to fuels, is there any technology ready for a scale application and sustainable from an economical point of view by 2030? Thank you. Um, from the point of view of the technology, there are a number of demo plants. And actually, this is a quite active uh, topic and area of, of research in the last years. And there have been, uh, there are some announcements no, from, from oil and gas companies investing in demo plants to produce these, these fuels. And, and also some uh, non-oil and gas uh, companies also uh, investing on developing this, this technology. So a lot of things are, are moving on in DC fuel technologies. And uh, we foresee or we expect this technology to be commercially uh, available at scale, at, at least the first of a kind, uh, close to this 2025 20, timeframe, no? based on the announcements that have been made. Uh, that's the first part of the question, the technology side of the question. The other side of the question is at the economic uh, considerations for these uh, e-fuels. Um, and here, uh, what we see is like the, the it depends on what you compare the e-fuels uh, versus or which is the basis of comparison, the conventional oil, uh, diesel, oil-based diesel and, and gasoline, uh, biofuels or, or I don't know, what other references we use, because the main uh, driver for the cost of these fuels is the electricity cost. So you have to have access to cheap, renewable electricity to produce um, uh, that hydrogen and to capture the CO2 and convert it into an e-fuel. And therefore, the price of electricity is, is a key aspect. So the economic, uh, the economic aspects of the, the production of fuels are really dependent on this. Uh, and therefore, that's why um, the location of those seafood plants, in the, at least in the short period of time, is uh, critical um, to have access to a continuous source of, uh, let's say, cheap or at least economically available uh, renewable electricity. So we don't this we don't see this to happen in the coming years uh, because of course renewable at least not in Europe uh, renewable electricity needs to be uh, further developed and deployed and, and the cost needs to be uh, also reduced but in certain areas of Europe uh, and under certain circumstances we see low uh, prices of electricity that could make um, kind of business case for DC fuel. So in the short period of time, I would say very uh, located the specific um, uh, related issue for the economic point of view and from the technology uh, point of view, we need to boost. Uh, we will see how DC fuels are also recognized in the in the policy framework uh, because the, the framework is, is not clear yet. So a lot of number of issues, no, they need to be solved. But, Let's say that a lot of research and development, and also with investment from the from some oil and gas companies, are are there uh, to to really explore the potential of this technology. Great. Thank and, you. and finally, one last question for Thomas from Per Riesberg. Uh, this is kind of a global question. So, with population growth in Africa and India adding to an increased standard of living, the main CO two challenge will likely be on those continents. Are there any technically and economically realistic projects regarding refuels there? This is an indeed very, very important question. <laughs> and it would be another seminar of two hours to discuss all this. Let me select one issue. Today, we 
have commerce with fossil fuels all over the world, Arabia, Africa, for instance, and other countries. And I'm convinced, that's my personal belief, that we should offer these countries with which we make commerce today, a possibility to have a long-term successful cooperation. But this must not be fossil fuels. This is also clear. And I think it is a very attractive possibility also for India, also for other countries who have sun, who have who, which have wind, which have um, sun and other energy, regenerative energy, which is called, although it's not correct from the thermodynamics perspective, but it's another issue. But offer these countries a possibility to make trade with us, to prosper in an economically successful way. We can utilize this CO2 free energy here. We make trade with these countries. We um, can ensure that these are stable democracies. And I think this is also very attractive um, perspective um, and um, others could also be discussed, but I think enabling countries of the third world and second world to be a successful player of the future with CO2 neutral energy, this is a very, very attractive idea. Thanks, Thomas, and thanks to Marta, to both of you for some great insights on this panel, and thanks to you guys at home for asking some great questions. We've had a couple of questions come in on biofuels, which I've saved because that webinar is going to be on Thursday. So on Thursday at 3.15, we're going to be talking about liquid fuels in the bioeconomy. So be sure to tune in for that. Uh, but for now, I'll close out this webinar. Thanks so much to our panelists. And I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. Bye-bye. <laughs>